So last time we were talking about the pendulum and we saw kind of a, a algebra way to get the period for the pendulum. And now we'll talk about uh, mass and spring systems. And I'll show you how you would set that up to solve it with calculus. And then I'll just show you the answer. So we're still looking at simple harmonic simple harmonic motion. And for the first part, we'll focus on the mass spring system. So you have a mass that's sitting, for example, on like a horizontal table. This has a mass M and then your spring constant is K. And so remember that your spring force is negative K times X or Delta X. Where this is the displacement from equilibrium position. So in this example, the spring force is your restoring force. And so what that means is that that is the force that is trying to restore the system to its equilibrium position. So in this red line, I've drawn the equilibrium position. And so if we Let's say we compress the spring. And then if I release the spring, so let's say number one, number two, In picture number three, my spring is restoring the mass to the equilibrium position. But now it has some velocity. And so because this thing is moving with some velocity V, it's going to overshoot the equilibrium position. And the spring is going to end up being stretched out. So maybe I'll draw velocity in blue. So this has a spring force pushing it this way. Then when it gets to the equilibrium position, there's no longer a spring force acting on it, but it has velocity causing it to overshoot the equilibrium position. And then at position four, now there's a force in the opposite direction 
that's trying to make the spring go back to equilibrium. And this process would just keep repeating over and over again, where the mass is just going back and forth on either side of the equilibrium position. And so if you set up your Newton's law equation, And now this is the part where the calculus comes in. So uh, you don't necessarily need to worry about this part, but the acceleration is two time derivatives of position. And so when you replace that, your acceleration with that second derivative, And let's divide the mass. Or so first we'll move everything so it's on the same side of the equation. And then we'll divide the mass, divide everything by M. Now this thing in the red box is a differential equation. And there's an entire branch of mathematics that deals with solving these things, uh, but you don't need to know how to do that. And I'll just show you the answer. So the solution to this is so, and broad strokes, we have a second derivative of position with respect to time. And then we have another term that has the position in it. So X is the position. So solving this differential equation means finding a solution or an equation for X as a function of time. So this is position as a function of time. And so there are different types of solutions for that differential equation, but the simplest one is going to be either a sine or cosine. We'll use cosine. Look at this, A is the amplitude. So how far you stretched the spring to start with. So amplitude or initial stretch of the spring. And then omega is the angular frequency. T is the time. So the, we are looking for the position as a function of time. Uh, one of the rules for mathematics is that uh, cosine, whatever the answer or whatever number you get out of cosine uh, doesn't have units. Uh, 
And so therefore, all of the units are just coming from this initial stretch of the spring. So if we're doing everything in our standard units, then this would have units of meters. <laughs> And so whatever answer comes out of the trig function isn't going to have units. And also whatever units are inside the trig function, all the units have to cancel out. So we remember that angular frequency was one over seconds. Time would have unit of seconds. And so you see that both of those units would cancel out. So if you're ever trying to stick random things inside of a cosine. Uh, if your units don't cancel out, then you're probably not multiplying the right things together. And so if we look at our differential equation again, So this so what we wrote up top is the solution to this differential equation. And so the only term, so we know that omega is the angular frequency, but we can get that angular frequency by looking at this differential equation. And it's going to turn out that omega squared equals square root k over m, or no, omega squared is k over m, or omega is square root k over m. And then something to keep in mind for when we talk about waves later in class is that if we plot a cosine, then it would look something like this. Where this Initial displacement from the equilibrium position is the amplitude A. The, dis the time from the peak to peak would be the, the period, which we've seen previously. And then we also saw that the frequency is one over the period. And we saw that the angular frequency was two pi over or two pi times the frequency. Or in other words, the angular frequency is two pi over the period. So just by looking at this graph, we could find the period and then use that period to find what omega is. And we know omega is square root k over m. And then also looking at the graph, we can find the amplitude. And so just by looking at this graph, we know everything that would go into this equation. And then as we're looking at this graph, keep this kind of picture in mind for when we talk about waves, because this is what waves look like. And so these 
concepts that we're talking about will also apply to waves. We're talking about damped oscillations. So can you guys think about what would cause damped oscillations? What kind of forces? Yeah, friction, air resistance. Uh, whatever we called it when something was moving through a fluid. Yeah, so those are all things that can cause damped oscillations. And so in that case, if we think about stuff that was moving through a fluid, we said that the, uh, I'll just call it the damping force is gonna equal negative B times velocity, where B is just some damping term that's gonna depend on maybe the viscosity of the liquid or some other properties. And then this is the velocity. So this is the kind of force that would cause, or this is a type of force that can cause something to not oscillate indefinitely. And again, if we know calculus, then this equation would look like this because velocity is the first derivative of position with respect to time. And so we can write another differential equation where, I guess I'll show you where it comes from. So the, if we set up our, some of the forces equals MA equation, now we've got two forces. We've got the spring force and the damping force. So if the spring force has a negative in front of it, then the damping will not because the damping force is always in the opposite direction. And so then if we replace everything with the correct derivative terms and move everything to the same side of the equation, then we would get something that looks like this. And again, you don't necessarily need to follow this step Uh, but this, this is just to give you an idea of what it looks like. Now we have another differential equation and this looks different because now there's a, there's two derivative terms and that makes it more challenging to solve. And The solution to this differential equation will look like this. So again, we're just looking for a function of the position with respect to time. So again, this amplitude or this A is just the amplitude. This exponential term is gonna be due to the damping. 
And so that B is the same B that you see in the damping equation. And then the cosine, it looks pretty similar to the cosine term that we had before, only now there's this extra phi term. So this is a phase shift. And it can get complicated to where this phase shift is important, but uh, for all of the stuff that we're gonna do in this class, just you, we're just gonna ignore this for now. So ignore. And if we ignore that, then the cosine term looks the same as it did before. So we had this solution. Oh, did I forget to write? Yeah, I forgot to write the T here. So in this exponent, this whole thing is multiplied by T. And then I'm just gonna ignore the, the phase shift term. So now this omega term is gonna be slightly different than what we had before. So this omega term is the square root of omega zero squared minus B over two M squared. This omega zero term is called the resonant frequency. And we've already seen what this is. So this is the square root of K over M. So resonant frequency or the frequency that you would have if there was no damping going on. And then again, this B term is due to the damping and to the M is just the mass. And so this equation is what is gonna govern how the system behaves. And so there's gonna be three different possibilities for the inside of this square root term. So the first is that K over M is greater than B over two M squared. So now if we make our graph of position versus time, so what I'm plotting in red is just gonna be to help me. It's not the actual graph yet. So the, what I just did in red is kind of a, an exponential curve above and below the axis. And then the graph would be your regular cosine, but now it's constrained by this 
um, by this exponential curve in red, And so you see that your amplitude starts to decrease. So in this scenario where K over M is bigger than B over 2M squared, this is called underdamped. And this is what your graph looks like. So if you were thinking about a mass spring system, if you stretched it to one meter, then each time it oscillates back and forth, now it's not stretching to one meter anymore. Maybe it's 0.9 meters and then 0.7 and then 0.2 until it eventually stops moving. So that's underdamped we can have the situation where K over M equals B over two M squared. And so in this case, if you look at the square root that this would be under, this would just be uh, inside the square root would go to zero. And then cosine of zero is just one. So all you would be plotting is really this exponential decay. So here there's no more oscillations anymore. And you start from your amplitude and then you just exponentially decay down to the Um, equilibrium position. So this situation is called critically damped. So these are X position versus time graphs. And then the final condition that you could have is if the resonant frequency is less than the B over 2M term. And there you're also gonna get a, an exponential, but it's going to be, it's going to decay slower than your critically damped term. So that shouldn't really be a straight line. I'm just not good at true. And so this is called overdamp. And so for the most part, things are gonna be underdamped. So you'll, in real life situations, you'll have a pendulum or a spring that's oscillating and eventually it'll, it'll do several different, it'll go through several periods of oscillation, but eventually it would come to a stop. And so this is one of the examples that you can think of for this is if you're swinging on a swing set. So if you, once you got up to a certain speed, if you stopped pumping your legs, you would still be swinging, but eventually you would slow down and come to a stop. So in that case situation, you would have damped oscillations. But what if you don't want to stop, you want to keep swinging? or you started from rest and you wanted to start swinging. 
well, you would start pumping your legs so that you started moving, right? That's a, what you're doing is applying some force that's driving your oscillation. And so the, uh, if we look at our differential equation, we're gonna take what we had before and just add another term. So what we had before, was this, and it was equal to zero, but now if we are driving it, then on the right-hand side, there will be some driving force. And if you're trying to make something oscillate, then a typical driving force that you would use would be some cosine or sine term. times t. <clears throat> so if you think about when you're sitting on the swing set, you're not just always pushing your legs forward. Like sometimes you push your legs forward, sometimes you push your legs back. And so that's a cosine or oscillating force that you're applying. And then the solution, so the, again, there are different kinds of solutions for this that we could come up with. Uh, the one that we're gonna use for this class looks like this. And now, the amplitude is no longer a simple constant. It's now going to depend on, oh, maybe I have too many amplitudes. So the amplitude for the driving force, we'll just call that F zero. And so the conceptual thing to look at here is this, the denominator of this amplitude. So if there were no, so no damping, then B would equal zero and your amplitude would just be square root of m squared omega squared drive minus omega naught squared. But again, in the real world, that's not usually gonna happen. There's always gonna be some friction or air resistance or something. And then the other thing to look at, so this uh, omega zero is still the resonant frequency. So for a, 
mass spring that was square root of k over m or for a pendulum it was square root of g over l L over G. Right. Yeah. And so you'll see if you set your driving frequency equal to your resonant frequency, then you're maximizing or you're minimizing the denominator, which means you're maximizing the amplitude. And so if you think about, again, being on a swing set, there's a certain frequency that you need to pump your legs in order to swing higher on the swing set. If you don't pump your legs at that frequency, then you might move a little bit, but you're not going to reach the, the highest points that you can on your swing. And then if you looked at this no damping case and you set them equal to each other, then you would get uh, that this term, this amplitude term would go to infinity, which is not correct and part of that is because this is uh, this is just one solution for this differential equation and it's not a good solution to use in that regime or another thing that you can think about is that there really aren't any systems with no damping uh, so it wouldn't really make sense to try to analyze this in the case where the driving frequency is equal to the resonant frequency if there's no damping. But again, the key takeaway is just that if you set your driving force equal to your resonant frequency, then you maximize the amplitude of your oscillations. Okay. So we've seen damped oscillations and then we've seen driving.